Well, let me be the first one to say welcome back to SPX. Um, it's been a long time coming. But the second thing I want to say is why would they put the other black creator at 4 o'clock, like at the same time as, as this? Is anyone leaving to go to James Spooner's thing? Because I'm leaving at, at 4. No, no. No, but, but it's, it, it's sort of silly that that, that, that happened. Um, I was gonna show an episode, but I don't wanna show an episode and then people leave just after that, you know? So uh, I think what we'll do is just talk about the show and um, I'll show you some exclusive behind the scenes uh, photographs that uh, I didn't lose with my original phone um, from, <laughs> I lost all these photos because I didn't put it up in the cloud. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm over 50. I don't know how to use it. And um, so here we go. Um, just to give you an idea of sort of the timeline of it, I moved to Los Angeles in 2008 after the crash of the newspaper industry and I realized I'm not going to have a, a job pretty soon. So I was like, uh, I'm going to move to L.A. and get a TV show. And so uh, I moved down there with my wife. We didn't know anybody, so we spent a lot of time at home, and we had babies. So uh, once we had babies, um, then it was like really like I needed to, <laughs> to, to get a real job. And um, so I did a lot of drawing um, in in Culver City, um, my home cafe was just across the street from Sony. And I remember my wife going, um, do you want to do one of those Sony tours? And I said to her, no, like, I don't want to be a tourist on the tour bus looking at people walking around Sony, you know, going like, well, yeah, I want to work there. I want to be the person where the people on the bus go, who the hell is that, you know? <laughs> so the irony of, of of that is um, Sony co-produced the show, so it turned out that I was that guy sitting in Sony and people on the bus going, who the hell is that? So, um, but that was an amazing uh, thing. And what happened is I learned, I, I met some, a, a, a producer who was pretty young and not a lot of credits, but he was really, really enthusiastic and had a really great vibe. And my advice to everybody is, you know, there are not a lot of really positive, great people in, in Hollywood. So when you find one, I, I, should, I shouldn't say that, there are, but there are also a lot of assholes. So when you meet somebody like who, you know, hitch, you can hitch your tag, wagon to, do that. And I assume that, like, the reason why Ron's here, and I want you to talk, <laughs> is Ron is, is experiencing the early stages of this, right? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm curious about <clears throat> the entry point for you. But yeah, I'm just, I'm just starting out. I'm kind of uh, starting to write um, and create things. And I, I had the fortune of meeting pretty much positive people exclusively, but the sort of cynic in me is just like, well, it's because of I like how I've come into it. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm coming from a position of relative power, <laughs> you know, like, um, I'm, I'm, I'm the cow, you know what I mean? I have the milk. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so. that is a huge yeah. point. Hollywood is looking for content and cartoonists are creating that content. Like, and so my advice is to hold on to the rights to your work. Like, don't let some publisher be like, well, they have to go through me and blah, blah, blah. And that's one of the reasons why I've self-syndicated for so long and put out my own books, is so no one's going to screw with it. Um, but yeah, so I hitched my wagon to this one producer who got a gig with um, the actor Eric Christian Olsen from NCIS. Do you ever see that? Deeks? He's he's like the likable white dude in uh, NCIS LA. He's very um, he's 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 like his own, his character. He's very um, enthusiastic, and I feel like he could convince anybody to do anything. And his dad was uh, a 
retired um, black literature professor. Mm. And he, sh he showed- Wait a minute, wait a minute. A black literature professor or a black literature professor? <laughs> a black literature professor. <laughs> so his, he showed his dad my work and his dad said, this will be the most important show that you ever make. He was like really determined. And so I was like, all right, I got this guy in, in my corner. Hmm. And he brought it to a bigger production company. It was like, you know, this producer and then this bigger producer and then this bigger producer who had a deal with Sony. They brought hmm. it to Sony and Sony was like, yeah, let's let's try to, to, to get a deal with this. And so um, they paired me up with um, a writer who was experienced, Marshall Todd, in, in the industry. And we worked up this pitch together. Mm. And a lot of the pitch was just basically my stories of being stopped by the police. Can I get a timeline? Like, when was, <clears throat> when did you put together the pitch? Um, maybe it was after I moved to North Carolina. So I would say mm. maybe 2016. So, okay, um, for people keeping count. <laughs> uh, when, you, when you started, when you met the producer, um, and it was like a little twinkle in your eye that you may want to make a TV show. That was a, a few years before. Right. right yeah. Right. So it's it's been a long journey, and um, but meeting this writer and and then we talked about we both had experiences with the being profiled by, by the police. So we thought it was a great jumping off point. Um, for this character to be traumatized by the police. It opens his third eye. Um, stuff, inanimate objects start being animated. It was, I didn't want the, car, the thing to be about a cartoonist. Like, there's nothing more boring than watching a cartoonist sit at his de desk or their desk drawing. Like, so it was like, how can we manifest these cartoons in a different way mm. that would make it interesting? And I always liked, like, the sixth sense, like, how you didn't know where the next ghost was coming from, you know? So it's just like, you don't know where the next animation's coming from. And so it's we- coming from a bunch of people in a room working way too hard. Yeah, yeah, well. Hours a day. That's but, where it's coming from. Um, so we worked up this pitch of like telling these stories and, and I just remember saying like, I just want, um, I want a scene where my character picks up a trash can and throws it against the window, I'm gonna do the right thing, but it just bounces off. Like that, <laughs> that is yeah. a distillation of what this show is about, which is my character's the Charlie Brown of activism. And so if you can do like a, a, an elevator pitch, like if you can sit, the elevator pitches, if you're in an elevator for like, a, if you can say that to an executive, like, and you could sell the show. Mm -hmm. Like that's what you wanna try to do. So um, I'm so excited I got that scene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I got that scene made. Um, so, um, you know. <clears throat> Question. Yeah. Your pitch, this is when did you did you work up something like uh, audio visual or was it like you in a room with maybe a slideshow? Uh, Not a slideshow, but like you, de I definitely had visual. So f first of all, I, I had a package of, of my cartoons. So you know some of my best cartoons uh, we gave to everybody. But I did have this pitch where I told these stories. You know, I think I think the story that really sold them on it was, you know, obviously the police one. But there's always the twist at the end, which is my character gets robbed by somebody that looks mm -hmm. like, you know, like it sort of has that twist at the end. Mm -hmm. And and the story, I, I the other story I told, and this was a true story. Um, I was on a bus uh, in San Francisco. And there were these two 15-year-old kids in the back, and they were swearing up a storm, like, so fuck, fuck this, fuck, you know, saying all this stuff. And there were all these old ladies on the bus, and it was really awkward and weird. And there was this one dude who was sitting across from me, and he was dressed really nice and, and like, really sitting up, um, almost like... Actually, Hoche, Hoche like the oh, way word. he, yeah, 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 yeah like yeah. really like, this dude has it's got his stuff together. Um, but he was Latino, and he just, it turns out he was a spoken word poet because he sat up and said, yo, I don't like my ears being poisoned by this vective, like really loud. And then those kids shut up really fast. <laughs> and all the old ladies were turning around saying, thank you, thank 
They would say, no, you know, like it was really nice. And uh, I was like, all right, so I think I'm going to do that like next time this happens. And so, you know, of course, when I, this really happened, when I tried to do it, like before I was even finished with the third word, they were, the kids were like, fuck you, I'll <laughs> kick your ass. Like they were sc screaming at me. And I'm, I apologize for the language. I know young ladies in here. But, um, but it was just like a perfect, you know, distillation of what the show would be. And, uh, and they love that. And um, so, uh, and, and here's the biggest thing. A million years ago, uh, Dark Horse did a 500 page collection of my work. There was a trend where everyone's like, oh yeah, do a complete thing. And, and so th these books that were like the size of, of, of as, as wide or as in every dimension. a phone book, yeah, <laughs> giant books. Yeah, and they were, it, it, you know, it was like, yeah, 500 page, but it was a nightmare mm -hmm. to mail. And it was a nightmare to store. And it was a nightmare to take to any convention. Mm -hmm. So it was useless to me. But I ordered 10 of those. So we went to HBO, Amazon, uh, Hulu, Showtime. Like, you start, at, you start at the top, and then you end up at the CW. You if, the if, if you, you get rejected by everyone. You the bottom of the top while you get your pitch, right? No. Th you no, you started. You went to your, you went to your be best shot first. Yeah. Sony set us up with <laughs> Netflix. HBO, Showtime, like all the top, and then like you go down, down, down to the CW. And, but we never left the top. Like it, but this is what happens is, is you get better as you pitch. So it, the first pitch is always terrible. The second pitch gets a little better. The third pitch, I think you start to hit your groove. And I'm sure we hit HBO, uh, Hulu at like the third or fourth pitch. And so three places were interested. Hulu was very aggressive, but this is what happened. I ordered 10 of those books, and every time I finished uh, a pitch, I would stand up, pull this giant book out of the bag, and chuck it up in the air, and it would slam on the table, and I'd go, there's your first 10 seasons, and I'd walk out. <laughs> and I swear to you, when we were shooting the first season, an executive came up, uh, and we were at a bar like later on that night, and he said, he said, you know when you sold the show is when you threw that book mm -hmm. on the table. And so there's something to be said about a little bit of drama, you know, a little bit, because all these places try to intimidate you as you're walking down their hallways. You know, there's giant posters of like Breaking Bad and mm -hmm. Game of Thrones and like all this crazy stuff. And so you, it makes you feel like, oh my God, like what am I doing here? Like, mm -hmm. you know, so what I did in the parking lot of each one of these places, I was in my car, and I have, you know, I don't have a lot of them, but I have like my Inkpot trophy, my Harvey Awards trophy, like, and I put them all up on my dashboard before, and I, and I just psyched myself up, like, the, what, you know. What's it like to win an award? <laughs> I like, <laughs> I usually don't apply for them, so. Like, I've never won uh, uh, an Iggy, which they should be called Iggy's, by the way. For now on, just call them Iggy's. Never won an Iggy. Um, I never, like, I just lost uh, Ruben Cartoonist of the Year uh, just the other day, so I'm a multiple loser. Um, but, um, but what I have, I think I did have, like, my junior high, like, most artistic award. But you just psych yourself up saying, like, they need me, like they need content. They need, like, I have the voice that they're looking for. So you just psych yourself up. And those big posters will still knock you down a few times, but you're big enough to go in there and just convince them. Like, you just fake the confidence, just fake it. Uh, so, so I have make a question. It. Yeah. So next, right, <clears throat> they pair you with the writer. Sony paired you with the writer? I interviewed a bunch of different writers. Okay. And so this is before the pitch, the writer is attached to uh, in the pitch. We worked together to okay. come up with the pitch. Now, I see. There were a lot of writers who wrote these scripts. These, and whenever I saw a trope, there were a lot of white girlfriend brings black boyfriend home to white parents, and just watch the antics ensue. And I was just like, I you know, seen that film. Yeah, dis, I d dismissed right away. Marshall Todd's script. <laughs> Like the first thing it was, was it opens up with like a, a, a black man um, 
<laughs> snorting cocaine off the glass of a gun in a gun shop <laughs> and like a thing and like a male a postal worker comes in and says hey um, is that your car out there? And it's like, yeah. It's like, there's a bunch of high school girls like smashing it with baseball bats. Like, that's how it started out <laughs> and just went crazy from that. I was like, and I remember calling up my producer going, I think we're going to have to reel this guy in a little bit. <laughs> but like, it was really, like, really crazy and, and amazing. And that was a writing sample or was that like a whole? That was a minutes? writing sample that Marshall. Uh, how many and pages he, was that? It was a whole script. I was, okay. It was like 24 or 27. Was it was a, a tentative pilot? He did that as a mental exercise. He didn't, he said he never meant that to be seen by anybody. Okay. And he actually got another deal from that. Wow. Yeah, which is crazy. Like, and he, he, he said he was ready to give up like being in the business and he just wrote that and and that's gotten him do, his most successful stuff do you want to explain to the audience what like the first six minutes of uh of an episode particularly a pilot what what the function of that is and like why that's so you know spectacular and important uh to kind of start off that way well it, it, it's 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 an interesting thing because you're really establishing what this show is and so you know i looked at a lot of opening of, of pilots and there's some pilots that you know shows don't get their footing till the second or third season but there are some pilots you know um it you may not like uh some of the shows but it's good to check out the show like uh what's the one cheers the the spinoff of that frasier mm. the frasier thing is really good like it's um He's on his radio show, and somebody calls up his radio show and says, like, blah, 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 you know, he's got this problem. And then Frazier explains back to him, uh, let me give you, you me as an example. Six months ago, I was in Boston in this bar, and I had this relationship. Like, it, it was like a perfect way to catch people up without, like, having, you know, it, it, was, it was just really good. What? Oh, uh, the ghost, Mr. The Scooter, ghost? <laughs> we were just talking about how, why they would have us both at the same time. Like, I'm really, yeah. <laughs> so I hope you're not there to lead, you know, what's the, uh, the guy that leads all the, the things out of Ireland? Like, are you doing oh. that to us? Um, okay, I'm going to get to photos and stuff, but like, Q&A, we'll talk about that. I'm just going to... Uh, Rush through that. This is me on the set of the apartment. It was really great to recreate the apartment. Um, there was some neat stuff in there um, that was in our original apartment. The windows and everything were very similar to the, to that the San Francisco apartment it was in. Um, uh, I remember first seeing it and I said, "There's too much stuff in here and it's too neat. Like it has to be a little bit sloppy." Um, here are, are basically the core of, of the show. Myself, and then Marshall's on the other side there. Marshall instilled, like, Clovis the character was not the same character in the comic strip. And, and Marshall made Clovis really an amazing character. And, and it was important for, to make Clovis the complete opposite of Keefe. Like, it's like yin and yang. Like, the way they operated were completely different. Uh, in the middle is is Maurice um, Mo. Uh, well, I'm spacing on his name. No. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Mo. I'm sorry. But uh, <laughs> uh, Mo, why am I spacing on his name? Anyway, Maurice was the most amazing. His vision of the show put it far and above everything else. Which is, he didn't want the animation to be 2D. He basically pitched that we do puppetry, that we do make it 3D and make it in the world. And, um, oh my God, Steve, can you remember? <laughs> Mo's going to kill me. Uh, anyway. Um, Subtitle this. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he, what directors approach you with is like a, a, a set deck and uh, the stuff that is going to influence the look of the show. He came with Do the Right Thing, which was one of my favorite movies, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which is one of my favorite couple movies with my wife, um, Amelie, which is my wife's, one of my wife's favorite movies, and then 
sorry to bother you. So those are the four things he came with. And I was just like, oh my God, like this guy is like uh, my brother from another mother. And I can't even remember his name, which when is really sad. When did you connect with Mo, like timeline wise? Mo came in after we. Um, uh, so now I'm going to look up his last I told name. I'm you, so yeah. sad. He should leave the phone on. I know. Um, um, he came in after we got the pilot. Okay. And so we started interviewing directors. And. Um, and we even were looking at Boots Riley, okay. um, and um, it was. Mo directed the pilot, or no? He yeah, he did. Okay. He did. He is a reason why um, the, the whole look of it, Marable, Maurice Marable. Yeah, it's the, the famous Marables. Um, but he is amazing. I mean, he took this picture. He takes selfies that are amazing. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, like, getting the actors, like, were just amazing. Uh, just, I was in on everything. So when I went for auditions and stuff, it, we saw people from, I would be like, oh, my God, this person's from Atlanta. Oh, my God, this person's from, like, there were so many shows, people walking in. And they just, as they came out, they would just thank me, saying, thank you for creating a character that's different than what we usually try out for, you know? Which was really amazing, but Lamorne just killed it. Like uh, the the sides that sides are a script that you do when people try out. The sides were him, um, a, a jar of mayonnaise starts speaking to him in a in a supermarket, and the jar of mayonnaise is complaining that uh, salsas and sor srirachas are taking its job, hmm. and uh, and so he's like on the floor talking to the the mayonnaise and then somebody working for the supermarket comes to him and you know he has to be like uh uh you know just he played it so well and uh it we there's we have a similar vibe that really like it was like a no-brainer mm -hmm. when he came on um there's eric from uh eric christian olsen <laughs> from from ncis and uh yeah that's uh that shows you how good my selfies are I think that's the very first selfie I did. We shot the first season in Vancouver in January and February, and it snowed ah, so or this rained. This shot in Vancouver? Uh, the first season. We okay. shot in Atlanta in July, wow. the second season, so completely the opposite. Mm -hmm. And everyone had to act like it was San Francisco, which is really tough. This is early versions, early drawings of the marker, mm -hmm. and... Um, well, this is you it's know kind of weird that it comes out of his torso that one that like it's coming downwards it's somewhat phallic yeah well, I think, well it's a, it's a marker it's all phallic yeah that's true um this is early versions of the 40s um you know it was so i have a question yes where you know when we're looking kind of like previs yeah this is pre this is all early versions and stuff um but yeah, it was just fun to make that type of stuff. Um, and this is, of course, um, the final versions. And then getting the voices, of course. It was Nicole Byer and um, Eddie, is Eddie Griffin? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I think. Uh, I didn't peep the credit. Um, but, uh, and then I was compiling toast and butter cartoons. So there were actually a bunch of toast and butter cartoons in here. And um, it was just fun to develop. And I was like, the worst thing that happened, if we don't get a series, I'll start up a Toast and Butter <laughs> strip. So I have a question for you. Yeah. When you were, um, was this your first TV show idea? Yes. Wow, so you're very lucky. Extremely lucky. And I didn't realize how lucky I was until I went to New York. And then all these cartoonists were saying to me, saying, because I was, by then, we were shooting the pilot, or we shot the pilot, and they're like, I've had development deals for 20 years, mm. and we've never gotten past the, even gotten to the script stage. Mm. So it's like, it's so lucky that you got this, you know, got to the pilot. And uh, so to even, I mean, I had people on set who said, I've been working in this business for 20 years, and I've never gotten a second season. So the fact that we got a second season, is, uh, believe me, I'm so grateful for it. But, so the prob the thing about this cover, if you notice, they put Keith Knight instead of Keith Knight. Like, that was the sort of, mm. the chain, like, it was weird in the writer's room. So we, we named the character Keith instead of Keith. 
so we could differentiate when we're talking about stuff. It was very confusing at first, but uh, that's, you know, this is the type of stuff where they tell you at the end, don't take this, you're not supposed to take this, and then they take it. The person who tells you not to take it takes it. Uh, this is some early, like, uh, you know, um, design costume stuff for the characters, and uh, that was really fun to pick stuff out and, and do stuff. I, I felt like the looks in the first season, particularly, um, maybe were inspired by someone like James Spooner. I remember he had like a Dead Kennedys t shirt on at one point. Yes. Band t shirts, lots of. Um, yeah. In, his, in the set, in the room. To me, the first thing I wanted to do was establish that this was going to be a little bit different. So I wanted him in the Dead Kennedy's t-shirt, and I wanted something other than hip-hop playing mm -hmm. um, the first song. And I, and I specifically wanted a female uh, singer. And uh, so that was, was super important. Was it X-Ray Specs? was it? Um, no, but X-Ray Specs was very expensive. Oh, well, um, they only uh, have one record, really. It was amazing. Like, my management said, listen, pay attention to everything. You're, you're a producer. Mm -hmm. You want to know how, like every aspect of it. So I really dove in and, and checked out every aspect of it. This is the guys reading the scripts for the first time. Uh, this is us on set in Vancouver for the police takedown. Look at the guy who's playing the cop. <laughs> Here, second Jesus season, Christ. I had so, like, and, and Lamorne's friends, so many white people were like, can I play a racist cop? Like, like almost like... I, I just let me get this out. Can I play a race? You know, like it was really weird. But the guy in the eighth episode won some award for for his role. So this is what we had to deal with um, when we were shooting the Oakland episode. Like <laughs> we got like four inches of snow. So some of the outdoor scenes actually became indoor scenes and actually made like that was the great thing about being on production is you get these problems every day and you have to sort of just like try to figure out and fix it. And, and, and when you're in it, it's sort of stressful, but in the end, it's really fun to solve these, these issues. This is some of the stuff to make it look like San Francisco. So this is a, a Muni uh, stop. Uh, California license plates you threw on all the cars. How many of those did you frame? Um, <laughs> what do you mean? Did you take any home? Oh, no, no, I didn't. I, did, I, you know, I, I have my original. Uh, California one from my car. Um, these are the guys, um, again, Blake Anderson. It, it was funny. Gunther was the hardest one to cast. Gunther, all the guys did well playing the stoner, but they came off as creepy. <laughs> but Gunther, once, he, once Blake came in, it was just like, oh, Blake is it. Like, he didn't even have to audition. He is just, like, amazing. And then T. Murph, you know, again... Clovis was supposed to be, uh, uh, Clovis was supposed, in, in the comic strip, he's much bigger, he's got dreads. You know, suddenly this guy comes in, he's tiny, he's got this big beard and just attitude. And I remember my wife going, that's Clovis right there, mm -hmm. that's Clovis. And, and even Lamorne wanted one of his friends, one of his mm -hmm. friends came in and did audition. Like Lamorne was like, yeah, this guy, mm -hmm. this, this, this is the guy who's Clovis. And he was, he was great. He was he was the breakout star. So one of the episodes, Black People for Rent, was based on a real poster. This is the poster that I hung up around San Francisco um, when it was being gentrified. And um, there's a whole other episode that was supposed to be a, that. And I, I think I'm going to create a, like a comic of like what the real episode was supposed to be. But uh, the first season, it was kind of wonky as far as the writing goes. But it's like, it was really super funny. It was supposed to be, has anyone, has everyone seen the show? Black People for Rent. What's supposed to happen was Clovis convinces Keith to go on, just do one of these jobs. And they go on to this job and they, sh they go do one of these black people rents, and they show up to this house where there's an elderly black woman who's dying, and his, um, her, her daughter just, like, the whole neighborhood used to be black, and now it's gentrified, and sh she just wants her mom to be surrounded by black people before she passes. So they show, and it's like a very solemn and like really means something. So they walk out, and 
Keith is very moved by it. And Clovis is like, see, like, this is, you know, this is it. And so they really go into the business of black people for rent. And it gets so busy that they have, have to hire more black people. So they have an audition for black people. And then they, black people show up and they start rejecting. <laughs> like, no, you're not black enough. Or like, like it's, it's, you know, the, the experience that I've had of people saying, you're not black, you know, you're not really black. But, so he's doing it to all, so all the black people that get rejected get mad and start their own black people for rent. And then they get booked at the same place. Mm. And so they, they show up and, um, and Keith notices that the elderly woman that was dying early on is, is in the group. Mm. And it turns out Clovis hired her, <laughs> rented her to play this role. So they, and so they get into a fight and then the white people that hired them call the cops on both, <laughs> both wow. groups and ends like that. That's good. So and that was the, the episode that didn't happen. Um, for those of you who don't know, I have a cameo in every se both season, every season, both seasons. I was the koala that got to punch my character in episode seven, and um, uh, apparently, like when I threw the punch, um, I heard someone say, "I don't think he's ever thrown a punch in his life." Wow. <laughs> um, also, uh, I got to hire my neighbor. Um, this is David Yuri, who plays Spooge in Breaking Bad. He had an ATM dropped on his face. And um, he got to fly up and play the creepy guy on the back of the bus of the Cubby episode. This is a picture taken by my twin sister, and I just include it because I think it's just an amazing picture. And everybody's getting ready to shoot some stuff, and I was probably sitting in there sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> but I really like that picture. Um, there are my sisters who came to visit me. Uh, on the one holding up the head is my twin sister, and then my younger sister is on the on the right. And um, yeah, it was fun. And we got the cubby outfit. There was n there were no decent cubby outfits uh, online, so we borrowed that. That is the mascot for. Uh, uh, an organic food company hmm. in Seattle. And they said we could borrow it, but we just had to make a donation to the, co like, remember when there was like a big fire, like in the koala sanctuary? They said, if you can make a donation. So we made a donation to the koala sanctuary and uh, we got the, you know, the, out the best outfit. Um, season two. So the difference between season one and season two, Keith gets therapy. Um, and so he's seeing less of the animated stuff. That was one of the points. And the other point was a lot of the stuff that happened in season one, he reacted to. So what we wanted to make sure with season two is he was making the decisions. And not all of them were very good decisions. So uh, one of the big important things that we wanted to do was pair off the characters in different, like, you know, Sashir so came in and kicked ass. Everyone loved her. It's like, we gotta make her a part of the gang. And so how do we put them in different situations? And so it was really fun to sort of write them in off into you know, different mixtures and situations. Um, this is the van for um, Clovis's dad, um, played by Isaiah Whitlock Jr. who uh, was um, in The Wire, and mm. I am obsessed with The Wire, and I like am so into it that That's I. That's why you squeeze that she in there. Yeah, it, 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 but, you. no, but he doesn't say it. Like yeah. he, he doesn't say it. In fact, I wanted to make him don't swear. I wanted him to be like, <laughs> but you know, he's Clovis's dad, so he had to yeah. swear. But it was great to hire him and just work with him. And this was his van, and he actually said, he's like, I'd like to take this van to Burning Man. And I was like, oh my God, like, that would be amazing. And I asked this, the prop people, they said, this van, you can't drive this van on the street. Mm. <laughs> like, like, they have footage of driving on the street, but they must have shot that at like mm. 5 a.m., like when no one was around. Um, 
I just like the shot, but this is us shooting, and, and that's basically how I spent a lot of the time, is sitting there uh, watching and listening. And you, you have writers on set to sort of, if uh, uh, lines aren't working or they're looking for alts, you come up with alt jokes and stuff. Sashir, um, when she had her uh, rent party, ep uh, the rent party episode, but she, she's a rock star. Um, it, it was, uh, she was amazing. Um, we, one of the characters we had to bring bar back was Dark Noir from the first episode, and, and I mean the first season. And it, you, you love it when you, get, when you get a guest actor that comes in and just totally kicks ass. Like it's just, you just sit there and go, oh my God, like this is amazing. And, and I always had, like even from the start, I was like, I've always wanted to do an episode of going on a, a, an ancestry show and it goes terribly, terribly wrong. So it was just, you know, <laughs> it's the only time I said to my family, I said, I hope you guys have a sense of humor. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm going to rip the family a little bit. Blah, blah. <laughs> um, this is what it was like behind, you know, outside of the apartment, outside of the Bay Area and outside of this is you're sitting behind a bunch of wood and uh, eating lots of snacks. That's basically it. So. Um, this is a very interesting scene, which is, this is the dream, uh, uh, dream sequence in episode eight of season two. We shot this for a completely different episode, a completely different point in time, and we didn't use it, because um, something, there was some special effect thing that he was supposed to be buried in shoes and it broke, so it wasn't working. But credit, like, one of our producers said, we can make this a dream sequence in episode eight. And so we repurposed it and made it a dream sequence. And it, I think it works out really, really well. Um, this is a, another silly episode where, you know, Keith gives, gives himself uh, an award, <laughs> which is, you know, uh, which will probably ha be happen to me because I never fill out um, any of the stuff to win awards. So hmm. I might as well give myself one. And that's probably the thing I should have taken, which is the award that he gives himself, but mm. I, didn't, I didn't take it. And uh, Lamorne uh, invited his buddy Billy to come and play a wacky publicist. Um, just to show you how much work I did, we couldn't find decent, just plain brown sneakers, and then I was in an old navy, and I saw brown sneakers, so I bought all of them. <laughs> like, this goes to show you, I've done, That's I did. get that producer credit for real. I did, I did so many weird, bizarre things, like, for, you know, like, the mime was gonna charge us, like, 600 bucks, and so, so I, I was like, I'll, I'll do the mime. Have you gotten the bug? Do you wanna, do you wanna maybe act as producer on another show, or? I, oh, you know, I would love to, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna produce, uh, the next thing that I do. Um, yeah, I think producing, I think it's just, I don't know, there's more money. <laughs> like, but, but I also like all aspects of it. I On like making... That you, that you maybe say if you're walking through, not to give you any, um, to make anything difficult for you, but have you ever been walking through SPX and you're like, hmm, do you see someone's work? And you're like, oh, I would produce that. I, you know, I've said this to Steve, uh, that like I, my deal is to have a production company mm -hmm. and to like yeah identify other folks and produce their stuff totally totally so be nice to me um this is one of my favorite episodes which is um we wanted to do a takeoff on one night in miami i don't know if you've seen the film but it's like these four historical figures get together so we thought it would be interesting if ayana uh tripped on mushrooms and manifested three historical figures and um it was really uh an amazing episode and and this is another example of like act like actors you uh, that are just you know, actors, guest stars who come in, and um, Harriet Tubman's secret girlfriend is the secret star. Of, <laughs> like, it was just hilarious. Um, again, cops, people love playing cops. I don't know why, but... Uh, um, cops love playing cops. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when we were shooting the sequence at the end of Kill Keith Knight and everyone's going, F Keith Knight, F Keith Knight. Like I called up my dad 
and uh, who's Keith Knight Sr. And I said, Dad, here, listen to this. And he's like, what's going on? He thought there was a real protest because we were shooting during COVID and like Atlanta had come out to protest against us <laughs> doing this. And he's like, why, why do they hate you? And I was like, no, 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 it's, it's make believe. <laughs> so here's the deal, like apparently, you know, I said like, I'm gonna play the mime. Like I'm not gonna, when I, we're, we don't have any money anyway, so I'll just play the mime. Apparently all I needed was the makeup, the hair, the, 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 beret and the gloves like that was my regular outfit i dress like a low rent mime so that was it like <laughs> i do have good pop and lock skills i don't know if you noticed that though so um <laughs> apparently we had no idea that there was this concerted effort to demonize the word woke um when we were shooting the first season but um, by the second season it was pretty clear that you know the name of our show was was hurting us a little bit uh and when we got you know when it was announced we weren't getting a season three we got more publicity from the announcement than i think the effort to promote season two because i clearly think that season two was really like a better written season and i really think we should have leaned into the idea of like you know the Santas trying to stop the show, you know, like just all these different things. I wanted to have billboards that said, do you suffer from second, you know, do you suffer from secondhand woke? You know, you may be entitled to compensation, stuff like that, just crazy stuff. And, um, but it, it just didn't happen. So, um, so, you know, the show died. And, uh, <laughs> but this is, yeah, this is, we shot this, um, this, uh, cemetery sequence like outside our offices in Atlanta with the old offices it was it was Tyler Perry's old studio he's got these huge new studios now which is pretty crazy so um, you know post show like the guys came and, and we did WonderCon in the spring and it was the first time we got to screen the show in front of an audience and it was wonderful it was great to hear that's why I want to show an episode here because this, I love just sitting with an audience and seeing what people laugh at and stuff. And just, um, it's a joy and, and fun just to, to do that stuff. And when people say, like, did you find it hard working with all these people, you know, since you're a cartoonist? And I said, it was, it was, one, it was like being in a band, you know? Like, you have an idea, you put it out there, and all these talented people make it happen and make it far better than you ever imagined. So we have 10 minutes left. This is um, a big art show that I had at the Cartoon Art Museum in San Francisco, and it was wonderful, 40 pieces. And there were people who walked in, like who didn't know I really existed. So they walked in and they were like, is this some sort of joke? <laughs> like, did they, like, did Hulu create all this stuff to make it? And they're like, no, this is a real person. <laughs> so and it's, it, it's funny to this day that people don't understand that I exist. Um, and, you know, the results of it, I got my honorary doctorate at my alma mater this oh, May. Wow. So I am Dr. Keith, Dr. Keith Knight, and uh, so that's really amazing. Practice honorary medicine. Yeah, and so that's, that's the end of the slideshow. Um, any questions? We have 10 minutes left. And, yeah, please, if you have questions, can you put it on the microphone? Um, yeah. And, you know, behind the column so we can't see you while you speak. Hey, is this on? Can you hear me? Uh, no. Lean into it and speak loudly and... Hey, all right, so question here. Um, I've been following you since like Cartoonists with Attitude um, and some of the events that you've been doing here in DC and SPX. Um, so I've seen you, you know, do all your comics and stuff. Is there anything that the fictional version of you that you maybe you're a little jealous of, you know, that you put into the show that you wish was really your life? Oh, um... Uh, no, I was jealous at some of the outfits that he had. Like, <laughs> I wanted to take some of the, the clothes that they had, but uh, Lamorne is a bit smaller than me, so I couldn't fit in some of the stuff. But no, like, I don't know, just... And I don't know, there was something... They, they, they had a good, like, a cool foosball table or and a hockey table that they had there, but, like, 
there were certain things that I was like, oh man, that'd be great to take. But, um, but the people that took the stuff would tell you not to take the stuff. I was very naive uh, in this Hollywood thing, but yeah, it's kind of weird. Any more questions? Uh, I'm curious about your content creation. Um, how has it changed from in terms of uh, creating traditionally versus uh, creating digitally? How have you uh, evolved in terms of that? Um, I really haven't evolved. I still do. I still use pen and ink. You know, I scan it and clean it up. I probably draw a little sloppier, knowing that I have Photoshop to clean it up with. But um, I don't know. I sell my originals, and so um, I, I, I. You know, I'm pretty old school, and um, I just think that the delivery of the stuff is different, you know, um, and trying to keep up a social media thing. I, there was, I remember the distinct moment where I stopped listening to people older than me and started listening to people younger than me. That was, like, the best thing I, sh I could have done. So young people are the future. <laughs> um, another question. I guess I was going to ask, so in the pilot, uh, you had got folks had cast one actress for Keith's, Keith's love interest, and then there was like recasting for that sort of, I guess, sort of a similar character in the show. Like, so how, how does like recasting and that kind of thing, like what, particularly between a pilot and, and into the series, like what is that sort of like? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. There, like early, the early version had Kirsten as my wife Kirsten as my girlfriend in it. And um, we had an actress playing her. And um, I think the point, the, the big thing was he had to lose everything um, at the beginning. And since it, it, was, it was hard because I was so protective of that character. So it was better to just remove her and have like someone come in later. So um, it was hard. I mean, I felt, I still haven't spoken to that actress yet, but like um, it, it, it's, it's hard. Like I didn't make the, that call. I think, I don't, I'm not sure who made the call, but it was like, you know, it's hard. Lamorne and, and T Murph and Blake are tough to wor work, like hang with comedically. And um, and Sashir obviously can, and um, and and so did Rose, and so you know, um, so we Stuff to hang with meaning like they are um, comedically. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're rough. Yeah. yeah, 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 and so and but it was hard finding another actor like this actress could do the like she was part German, so she could do a German accent. So when we, when we moved on, it was so hard to find an actress with German accent. I was like, okay, we, I, I don't, it, she doesn't have to be German. She just has to be, she has to be white and foreign because we were looking for a person who's white but outside of America so they can observe like the racial dynamics of that. And, um, and yeah, Rose came in and she, you know, she had, great nerd bona fides and, and was really, and, she, and you know, she made, Lamorne said she, her acting game was, was really good, so he really stepped up his acting game. And um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. This is kind of a tough, tough thing, but Hollywood is, is tough. Mm. It's tough. Uh, any other um, questions? So what, Give me the status of what's going on with your project. Like, you know, I know you were working on some stuff and then the pandemic hit and sort of, um, yeah, I, you know, Ron's doing everything at a younger age than I ever did. So it's, it's nice to watch him rise and do well and have Hollywood knocking and stuff like that. I, yeah, I don't I think maybe if I were to contract, like the one thing is like I'm doing like, a couple, a few different things. So I guess one of the things that I've been thinking about is, or a question I would have asked you, but then I realized like maybe you haven't had to, you haven't thought about, or maybe you haven't experienced this yet, which is if one of, one of the things I like about comics is you can finish, you know? 
um, and you can finish mostly pretty much on your own, right? Like you, you don't need to have the same resources or budget to complete something. Like with this TV show, it's like um, maybe you've ruined yourself because it's like you started something and then you, you at least com you kind of completed. Like you finished two seasons you finished, right? <clears throat> so um, I guess what I'm thinking at this point is like it's great to uh, – I appreciate comics because, like, say, if we're talking about film or TV, um, the uh, timeline is much greater unless it's ridiculously short. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, um, uh, you you have you're able to kind of make some of the choices that may be um, prohibitive when you're thinking about someone's like, well, that's great and that's art, but like, it's going to take however many millions of dollars to make this thing. And therefore, it needs to be able to produce or like to um, create that much amount to come back in because like it's a it's like a little business. It's like yeah, TV yeah. show is like you start a business and uh, <laughs> until it's over, you know. It, that's the greatest thing about the medium of comics is I say this all the time. You need a, a, a pen and a piece of paper. It, it's a budget of a dollar twenty-five, and you can set it in someone's stomach. You can set it in outer space. You can set it in Egypt with a few dots and a triangle, mm -hmm. and it's like it's no one sits there and goes, "Cats don't eat lasagna." Like they don't question it. It's like they it's automatic buy-in. But if you don't get the dinosaurs right in Jurassic Park, it's like I'm not going to watch this. You know. So uh, that's what's great about it, and and you know, uh, a few people said to me like, you should you should draw season three, like, and I, I I'm really like, I think that's a great idea to yeah, so rights wise you have it right so yeah yeah I I think I do I'm, I'm not <laughs> that's why you have a lawyer yeah I'm gonna sort of ask around if I draw Gunther the way that looks like Blake am I gonna get in trouble you know um, but. Yeah, some of the ideas for season three was like um, they do go to Burning Man and um, and Keith wrecks it for everybody. Like where Burning Man gets canceled by the federal government, so everybody hates him. But he also, um, yeah, I, the big swing I'm not going to talk about. But uh, uh, but you th probably don't have time to talk about this. But I have a question. Yeah, it's um, like an aesthetic one. Like it's really just, what do you think about? I don't know, the surreal turn in kind of black visual arts in film and TV. Like, did you think about that? And like how this show is kind of part of what seems to be like an aesthetic movement that's happening right now? Whether we're talking about, you know, Nope, Atlanta, um, Sorry to Bother You. You know, like there's been something that's been happening for, you know, about five years or so. Yeah, I, th I think for far too long, Urban realism has always been just it, black people and urban realism. That's it. Like, it that's always been the case. So to be able to do some surrealism, I think, is was just really important to do. But um, I, and then I, I thought it was you know there was a period of just like you know just terrible racist stuff happening. Like I, I just got sort of that was one of the points we wanted to make with. Um, while they're watching Black Trauma Five in in the hotel room, which is like it's just too much. Like, I, I you know let's let's get more Black Joy out there. So um, it was important for uh, you know I I always argued I didn't want I didn't want Black people with guns. I didn't want Black people just dancing in front of the camera like eh, like you know in the opening. I didn't want black men dressed as women unless they that's what they really do uh, you know not for comedic purposes and um and i didn't want you know really you know just hardcore ra racial suffering we've seen enough we've experienced enough i don't need to reflect it back uh again so then you know and i will that's my thing that's what i'll always stick to um thank you for sticking around and listening to this. You know, I, I forgot to put toast and butter. I ha actually have some toast and bus butter t-shirts upstairs that I forgot to put out yesterday. So if, you know, there's a few, and I have some other prints that I didn't put out yesterday. So come on by, say hello. If you have any more questions, please come by and uh, check out, wh where are you at too? I'm at N13. Um, 
I've got Prince of Cats there, which is, you know, optioned by Legendary, like we'll see. Yeah, Prince of Cats um, is optioned. And um, a comic I did with Ardbeg, the Scotch whiskey brand. Ooh, fancy time. See, he's doing stuff that I want to do. You could do it, man. Uh, all right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Cheers. Oh, Gigi. Um, huh?